preface to a collection of Shakespeare, William Collis Williams has a phrase with which, uh, a statement with which he uh, begins uh, this introduction to the effect that uh, he says, William Carlos Williams says, I'm al always surprised when somebody says Shakespeare is my favorite poet. Shakespeare cannot be anybody's favorite poet. Shakespeare is a university. <laughs> now, in the course of years, when I happen to be giving a talk in a, in a conference, in a, in a festival, etc., uh, outside New York, and people come to know that I teach at Columbia, they invariably come to me and say, oh, you teach at Columbia, you teach with Edward Said. Or, uh, oh, you teach with Edward Said at Columbia. Now, over the years, <laughs> this, has, this has mutated to the point of, uh, oh, you teach at Edward Said with Columbia. So Edward Said is a, is a university. <laughs> now, here, here at Columbia, of course, we are delighted and, and uh, we feel wonderful that uh, the best scholar and the most noble public intellectuals from four quarters of the world uh, appropriate uh, Edward Said. But I must confess in public that we have a secret joy to claim him sometimes exclusively for us here at Columbia. So please join me and my colleagues across Columbia University in welcoming the author of Orientalism, Edward Said. to say that it's impossible for me to express my feelings of gratitude and uh, um, enlightenment and sort of overwhelming uh, embarrassment at, uh, at this uh, day's proceedings, uh, which have really been marked by extraordinarily interesting uh, and to me especially uh, critically sharp interventions by, by everyone who spoke. Um, I, I, as I said earlier uh, in responding to this last panel, I, it was very hard for me to keep still because I wanted to keep jumping up and, uh, and saying things to everybody uh, about the points that were made. But I really think at the, at the very end here, you're all tired and don't want to hear my thoughts about everything that's transpired. Um, I, I limit myself, first of all, to uh, thanking very profoundly my friend and colleague Hamid Dabashi, who organized this panel, uh, this day rather, uh, several panels, and to my friend and comrade and longtime supporter at the university, uh, John, Provost Jonathan Cole, um, who described exactly the atmosphere of Stanford in the middle 70s when we were there together with our children uh, and our <coughs> worries and trying to get work done during that year uh, and has really been you know, marvelously um, uh, a force in the life of Columbia for you know, free thinking and free speech and ideas which are really quite um, superb and unusual, I think. I also want to uh, say to the various friends, uh, former students, colleagues, um, and associates, who, who, many of whom came enormously long distances for this day, uh, I want to say profoundly how much I appreciate it. I mean, there's no possible way I can do justice to your efforts. 
but believe me, every one of you, uh, the presenters, the commentators, the people who gave talks, every one of them uh, I thought was wonderful and has been, as Hamlet says, etched in the tablets of my heart. Um, having said so much about Orientalism, it seems kind of dumb to say more, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Um, nine years ago, in the spring of 1994, I wrote an afterword for Orientalism, which in trying to clarify what I believed I had and had not said, I stressed not only the many discussions that had opened up since the book appeared in 1978, but the ways in which a book about representations of the Orient lent themselves to increasing misrepresentation and misinterpretation. That I find myself feeling more ironic than irritated about that very same thing today is a sign of how much my age has crept up on me, along with the necessary diminutions in expectations and pedagogic zeal, which usually hedge the road, as I call it, the road to seniority. <laughs> The recent death of my two main intellectual, political, and personal mentors, Iqbal Ahmad and Ibrahim Abulod, who is one of the dedicatees of Orientalism, has brought sadness and loss, as well as resignation and a certain stubborn will to go on. It isn't at all a matter of being optimistic, but rather of continuing to have faith in the ongoing and literally unending process of emancipation and enlightenment that in my opinion frames and gives direction to the intellectual vocation. Nevertheless, it is still a source of amazement to me that Orientalism continues to be discussed and translated all over the world, now in 36 languages. Thanks to the efforts of my friend and colleague Professor Gabby Peterberg, now of UCLA, formerly of Ben-Gurion University in Israel, there is a Hebrew version of the book available, which has stimulated considerable discussion and debate among Israeli readers and students. In addition, a Vietnamese translation has appeared under Australian auspices. I hope it's not immodest to say that an Indo-Chinese intellectual space seems to have opened up for the propositions of this book. In any case, it gives me great pleasure to note as an author who ne had never dreamed of any such happy fate for his work, that interest in what I tried to do in my book hasn't completely died down, particularly in the many different lands of the Orient itself. In part, of course, that is because the Middle East, the Arabs and Islam, have continued to fuel enormous change, struggle, controversy, and, as I speak to you now, war. As I said many years ago, Orientalism is the product of circumstances that are fundamentally, indeed radically, fractious. In my memoir, Out of Place, I describe the strange and contradictory worlds in which I grew up, providing for myself then and my readers a detailed account of the settings that I think formed me in Palestine, Egypt, and Lebanon. But that was only a very personal account that stopped well short of all the years of my own political engagement that started after the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, a war in whose continuing aftermath, Israel, after all, is still in military occupation of the Palestinian territories and the Golan Heights, a war in whose continuing aftermath the terms of struggle and the ideas at stake that were crucial for my generation of Arabs and Americans and Jews seem to go on. Nevertheless, I do want to affirm yet again that this book, and for that matter, my intellectual work generally, have really been enabled by my life as a university academic. For all its often noted defects and problems, the American university, and mine, Columbia in particular, is still, I think, one of the few remaining places in the United States where reflection and study can take place in almost a utopian fashion. While at Columbia, I've never taught anything. I've, never, I've taught here for almost 40 years. I've never taught 
anything about the Middle East. Being by training and practice a teacher of the mainly European and American humanities and a specialist in modern comparative literature. The university and my pedagogic work with two generations of first-rate students and excellent colleagues has made possible the kind of deliberately meditated and analyzed study that Orientalism, the book, contains, which for all its urgent worldly references is still a book about culture, ideas, history, and power, rather than about Middle Eastern politics to cool. That was my notion from the beginning, and it's very evident and a good deal clearer to me today. Yet, my book is very much a book tied to the tumultuous dynamics of contemporary history. I emphasize in it accordingly that neither the term Orient nor the concept of the West has any ontological stability. Each is made up of human effort, partly affirmation, partly identification of the other. That these supreme fictions lend themselves easily to manipulation and the organization of collective passion has never been more evident than in our time, when the mobilization of fear, hatred, disgust, and resurgent self-pride and arrogance, much of it having to do with Islam and the Arabs on one side, we Westerners on the others, are very large, these are very large scale enterprises. Orientalism's first page opens with a 1975 description of the Lebanese Civil War that continued until 1990. But the violence and the ugly shedding of human blood continues up to this minute. We have had the failure of the Oslo peace process, the outbreak of the Second Intifada, and the awfully, awful suffering of the Palestinians on the reinvaded West Bank and Gaza with Israeli F-16s and Apache helicopters used routinely on defenseless civilians as part of their collective punishment. The suicide bombing phenomenon has appeared with all its hideous damage, none more lurid and apocalyptic, of course, than the events of September 11 and their aftermath in the wars against Afghanistan and Iraq. As I write these lines, I wrote them today, the illegal and unsanctioned imperial invasion of Iraq by Britain and the United States proceeds with an aftermath in physical ravagement, political unrest, and more invasions that is truly awful to contemplate. This is all part of what is supposed to be a clash of civilizations, unending, implacable, irremediable. Nevertheless, I think not. I wish I could say, however, that general understanding of the Middle East, the Arabs and Islam in the United States, has improved somewhat, but alas, it really hasn't. In fact, the hardening of attitudes, the tightening of the grip of demeaning generalization and triumphalist cliché, the dominance of crude power allied with simplistic contempt for dissenters and others, has found a fitting correlative in the looting, pillaging, and destruction of Iraq's libraries and museums. What our leaders and their intellectual lackeys seem incapable of understanding is that history cannot be swept clean like a blackboard, clean so that we might inscribe our own future there and impose our own forms of life for these lesser people to follow. It's quite common to hear high officials in Washington and elsewhere speak of changing the map of the Middle East, as if ancient societies and myriad peoples can be, could be shaken up like so many peanuts in a jar. But this has often happened with the Orient, that semi-mythical construct which since Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in the late 18th century has been made and remade countless times by power acting through an expedient form of knowledge to assert that this is the Orient's nature and we must deal with it accordingly. In the process, the uncountable sediments of history that include innumerable narratives and a dizzying variety of peoples, languages, experiences, and cultures, all these are swept aside or ignored, relegated to the sand heap along with the treasures 
that have been ground into meaningless fragments that were taken out of Baghdad's libraries and museums. My argument is that if history is made by men and women, it can also be unmade and rewritten, always with various silences and elisions, always with shapes imposed and disfigurements tolerated so that our East, our Orient, becomes ours to possess and direct. I should say again, as I do many times in the book, that I have no real Orient to argue for. I do, however, have a very high regard for the powers and gifts of the peoples of that region to struggle on for their vision of what they are and want to be. There's been so massively and calculatedly aggressive an attack on the contemporary societies of the Arab and Muslim worlds for their backwardness, lack of democracy, and abrogation of humans and women's rights that we simply forget in the process that such notions as modernity, enlightenment, and democracy are by no means simple and agreed upon concepts that one either does or does not find like Easter eggs in the living room. The breathtaking insouciance of jejun publicists who speak in the name of foreign policy and who have no live notion or any knowledge at all of the language of what real people actually speak has fabricated an arid landscape ready for American power to construct there an ersatz model of free market, market democracy without even a trace of doubt that such projects don't exist, really, outside of Swift's Academy of Legado. What I do argue also is that there is a dif difference between knowledge of other peoples and other times that is the result of understanding, compassion, careful study and analysis, as in Auerbach's case, for their own sakes. And on the other hand, there's knowledge, if that's what it is, that is part of an overall campaign of self-affirmation, belligerency, and outright war. There is, after all, a profound difference between the will to understand for purposes of coexistence and humanistic enlargement of horizons and the will to dominate for the purposes of control and external dominion. It is surely one of the intellectual catastrophes of history that an imperialist war confected by a small group of unelected U.S. officials, they've been called chicken hawks since none of them ever served in the military, was waged against a devastated third world dictatorship on completely ideological grounds having to do with world dominance, security control, and scarce resources but disguised for its true intent, hastened and reasoned for by Orientalists who betrayed their calling as scholars. The major influences on George W. Bush's Pentagon and National Security Council were men such as Bernard Lewis and Fouad, and when I say men, I use the word light, um, loosely, <laughs> such as Bernard Lewis, or, or sort of made up men, such as Bernard Lewis and Fouad Ajami, Experts on the Arab, and it's, thank you. Uh, experts on the Arab Islamic world who helped the American hawks to think about such preposterous phenomena as the Arab mind and centuries-old Islamic decline, which only American power could reverse. Today, bookstores in the United States are filled with shabby screeds bearing screaming headlines about Islam and terror, Islam exposed, the Arab threat, and the Muslim menace, all of them written by political polemicists, some of them my students, pretending to knowledge imparted to them and others by experts who have supposedly penetrated to the heart of these strange Oriental peoples over there who have been such a terrible thorn in our flesh. Accompanying such warmongering expertise have been the omnipresent CNNs and Foxes of this world, plus myriad numbers of evangelical and right-wing radio hosts, plus innumerable tabloids and even middle-brow journals, all of them recycling the same unverifiable fictions and vast generalizations so as to, so as to stir up America against the foreign devil. 
Even with all its terrible failings and its appalling dictator, who was partly created by U.S. policy two decades ago, were Iraq to have been the world's largest exporter of bananas or oranges, surely there would have been no war. No hysteria over mysteriously vanished weapons of mass destruction. No transporting of an enormous army, navy, and air force 7,000 miles away to destroy a country scarcely known even to the educated America, all in the name of freedom. Without a well-organized sense that those people over there were not like us and didn't appreciate our values, the very core of traditional Orientalist dogma as I describe its creation and circulation in this book, there would have been no war. So from the very same directorate of paid professional scholars enlisted by the Dutch conquerors of Malaysia and Indonesia, the British armies of India, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and West Africa, the French armies of Indochina and North Africa, came the American advisors to the Pentagon and the White House using the same cliches, the same stereotypes, the same justifications for power and violence. After all, runs the chorus, power is the only language they understand. In this case, as in the earlier ones. Every, as a student of empire, I can verify to you that every single empire in its official discourse has said that it is not like all the others. We're different. <laughs> that its circumstances are special. We're not like England. We're not like France. We're not like the Arabs. We're not like the Mongols. And everyone has said that it has a mission to enlighten civilize, bring order and democracy, and that it uses force only, only as a last resort. And, stat and sadder still, there is always a chorus of willing intellectuals to say calming words about benign or altruistic empires. As if, I mean, you know, as if they're talking about unicorns. <laughs> this language of benign or altruistic empires as if one should not trust the evidence of one's eyes watching the destruction and the misery and the death brought by the latest mission civilisatrice. One specifically American contribution to the discourse of empire is the specialized jargon of policy expertise. You don't need Arabic or Persian or even French to pontificate about how the democracy domino effect is just what the Arab world needs. Combative and woefully ignorant policy expert whose world experience is limited to the beltway, grind out books on terrorism and liberalism or about Islamic fundamentalism and American foreign policy or about even the end of history. All of it vying for attention and influence quite without regard for truthfulness or reflection or real knowledge. What matters is how efficient and resourceful it sounds, and who might go for it, as it were. The worst aspect of this essentializing stuff is that, this is for me the biggest crime, is that human suffering in all its density and pain is spirited away. Memory, and with it the historical past, are effaced, as in the common dismissively contemptuous American phrase, your history. 25 years after my book's publication, Orientalism once again raises the question of whether modern imperialism ever ended or whether it has continued in the Orient since Napoleon's entry into Egypt two, two centuries ago. Arabs and Muslims have been told that victimology and dwelling on the depredations of empire is only a way of evading responsibility in the present. You have failed. You have gone wrong, says the modern Orientalist, and you can't blame the empire. You did it. This, of course, is also V.S. Naipaul's contribution to literature, that the victims of empire wail on while their country goes to the dogs. But what a shallow calculation of the imperial intrusion that is how summarily it scans the immense distortion introduced by the empire into the lives of lesser peoples and subject races, generation 
after generation. How little it wishes to face the long succession of years through which empire continues to work its way in the lives, say, of Palestinians or Congolese or Algerians or Iraqis. We allow justly that the Holocaust has permanently altered the consciousness of our time. Why do we not accord the same epistemological mutation in what imperialism has done and what Orientalism continues to do? Think of the line that starts with Napoleon, continues with the rise of Oriental studies and the takeover of North Africa, and goes on in similar undertakings in Vietnam, in Egypt, in Palestine, and during the entire 20th century in the struggle over oil and strategic control in the Gulf, in Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Afghanistan. Then think contrapuntally of the rise of anti-colonial nationalism through the short period of liberal independence, then the era of military coup, of insurgency, civil war, religious fanaticism, irrational struggle, and uncompromising brutality against the latest bunch of natives. Each of these phrases and eras produces its own distorted knowledge of the other, each its own reductive images, its own disputations, disputatious polemics. My idea in Orientalism was to use humanistic critique to open up the fields of struggle, to introduce a longer sequence of thought and analysis to replace the short bursts of polemical, thought-stopping fury that so imprisons us in labels and antagonistic debate whose goal is collective passion rather than understanding and intellectual exchange. I've called what I try to do humanism, a word I continue to use stubbornly despite the scornful dismissal of the term by sophisticated postmodern critics. By humanism, I mean, first of all, attempting to dissolve Blake's mind-forged manacles so as to be able to use one's mind historically and rationally for the purposes of reflective understanding and genuine disclosure. Moreover, humanism is sustained by a sense of community with other interpreters and other societies and periods. Strictly speaking, therefore, there is no such thing as an isolated humanist. Second, humanism is centered upon the agency of human individuality and subjective intuition rather than on received ideas and approved authority. Texts have to be read as texts that were produced and live on in the historical realm in all sorts of what I have called worldly ways. But this by no means excludes power, since on the contrary, what I've tried to show in this book have been the insinuations, the imbrications of power into even the most recondite of studies. And last, most important, Humanism is the only, and I would go so far as saying, the final resistance we have against the inhuman practices and injustices that disfigure human history. We are today abetted by the enormously encouraging field of cyberspace open to all users in ways undreamt of by earlier generations, either of tyrants or of orthodoxies. The worldwide protests before the war began in Iraq would not have been possible were it not for the existence of alternative communities all across the world, energized by alternative information and keenly aware of the environmental, human rights, and libertarian impulses that bind us together in this tiny planet. The human and humanistic desire for enlightenment and emancipation is not easily deferred, despite the strength of the opposition to it that comes from the Rumsfelds, the Bin Ladens, the Sharons, and Bushes of this world. I would like to believe that my book, Orientalism, has had a small place in the long and often interrupted road to human freedom. Thank you.